about some best practices from the experience of the Wallace Excellence Awards. Um, we're going to hear directly from a few arts leaders on what's worked and what's not worked. We talked about how this takes persistence and it's a little messy and what they've learned along the way. So it's my honor and pleasure to introduce to our panel. Charlie Miller is the Associate Artistic Director at the Denver Center for the Performing Arts and Curator at Off Center. Um, we have their bios in the packet, so I will go through that. Marcela de Lamar, Executive Director of the Mexican Cultural Center, and Cookie Ruiz, Executive Director of Valley Austin. I'm gonna move to you now. Okay. So I'll start. I'll start with a few questions of our esteemed panelists, and then again, I'll solicit questions from the room, and we'll invite Bob Harlow back on the stage as well. So just as by way of introduction, and we'll go right down the line, um, if you could start by describing what was your mission-critical problem that you sought to address with your audience-building efforts, and specifically, who was the audience that you wanted to grow and why? And Charlie, we'll start with you. Hi everyone. Um, our mission critical problem was something that we started to see uh, around 2007, 2008 when that, the first iteration of that NEA study came out. Um, and, and we were noticing that our audiences were aging and the younger people were not attending the theater the way that their parents and grandparents did. Um, and then fast forward six years and um, there was a lot of buzz about Denver being a major uh, city for millennials and, and at the time when we applied for funding from the Wallace Foundation we cited a statistic that Denver had the highest percentage of millennials, second highest percentage of millennials per capita in the country, second to DC, and also that by 2016 uh, there would be nearly a million millennials living in the Denver, Metro Denver area. And so um, those two impulses uh, the declining audiences, the aging audiences and young people not being interested or attracted to theater in the same way, and the huge opportunity with all of these millennials moving to Denver um, really motivated us to focus on a younger millennial audience. At the same time, we realized that um, there was also a more adventurous audience of other ages who probably would have similar interests to millennials. And so we hypothesized that there would be this sort of halo effect if we created programming geared toward millennial tastes, that it would be engaging um, and interesting to people of other demographics, and, and that has proven out. Thank you. Buenos dias. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think our organization is uh, a little bit different than most of uh, my colleagues here on the panel. We have a very diverse audience, um, mainly Latino audience. So our reach was, uh, our challenge was, how can we include other audiences, uh, non-Latino, into our organization? So we decided, and we, through the, our board and our staff, to work closely with um, larger cultures in Denver so we can partner and create programs for um, audiences that may have interest in the Latino culture, Mexican culture specifically, as well as to embrace the growing population of um, immigrant uh, individuals moving to, to Colorado. So I think it was more of a collective um, conversations with partners, with our staff, and also with our Mexican uh, population in, in Denver to see how can we create a bridge um, to learn from each other and also help um, our organization through this um, support of the large cultures to better serve the community at large. We are committed to the uh, community at large, uh, including the Latino, non-Latino, and specifically the Mexican community. Uh, we embrace diversity, so that's one of our main goals in our organization, and we see, um, you know, we are now one of the city's cultural favorite partners, because we, uh, we have those conversations about how can we, all of us, um, look at our mission, and uh, collaborate in bringing audiences together. All right. 
and then in Austin, Texas. So um, coming from the foundation of about 20 years of sales data, it probably comes as no surprise to anyone that uh, those works that are more familiar to the audience have a tendency to enjoy uh, larger attendances and uh, more revenue than works that are less familiar. In the beginning, we thought it was about the art form itself. We had created a continuum on one side. We had placed the works that were classical that seen Swan Lake does well, the Precker, these sorts of types of ballets. And then we thought, well, then comes sort of neoclassical and then contemporary. Ultimately, the more that we looked at the data and the more that we just stood in front and uh, we had a huge whiteboard where we kept uh, segregating and re-aggregating the data and one day it just hit us uh, that it really wasn't about the description of the work at all. It was instead probably this issue of familiarity. So we, uh, from that point, we thought, you know, we've I've been going to conferences with folks like you for, and actually some of you, uh, for 20 years or more. Um, we all are working uh, at some level with our audiences. We're trying to engage our audiences. So uh, what if we could use this uh, extraordinary opportunity? Uh, and what if we could figure out uh, those audience engagement activities that have the highest efficacy rates? Where if we could find the way to spend the least amount of money but have the highest return on investment. And those issues for us with those audience engagement initiatives or strategies, we refer to as a familiarity framework. What if this framework could actually help us grow an audience for new work? Um, new work is really important to Ballet Austin because though, uh, as many ballet companies do, we appreciate the, the range of history of our art form, we actually exist to create new work. Um, we have recently received a major endowment to endow the creation of new, therefore less familiar work in perpetuity. So for us as an administrative team, um, supporting a, a producing choreographer, being more highly effective at that, at that is really important to us. So how might we grow that audience for new work? <clears throat> and further, uh, we also have a, a growing city. We have, I drove in from the airport and saw cranes everywhere. I felt like home. We have about 150 people a day moving to Austin over the last three years. So we're picking up 57,000 people a year over the last three years. We're growing, and we're growing and changing very rapidly in many ways. So what if we could become effective enough at this building this audience for new work, and in our case, often social justice work, um, working in that space? And what if, knowing that if you leave, um, if you have a relationship with your audience, our earlier research proved to us that that process of beginning to be a little more artistically omnivorous takes about three to five years for someone who's with, our, with us and involved in our audience engagement initiatives for them to be able to choose that. What, what if with this rapidly changing um, and sort of gloriously diverse city that we have, what if we could cheat time? Um, because we don't know that we're going to have three to five years. You all saw those lovely numbers. Ballet was on the rock bottom. That's not the experience we have in our own city. But what if we could actually do this in such a way that we could cheat time and begin to see that um, migration to works that um, were a little less familiar a little sooner? So that, that's the question that we're posing. Great, thank you. Um, Cook, you talked about trying to build audiences. I'm going to go off script a little bit, so I'll say the question slowly, get the panel, some kind of thing. You talked about um, building new audiences um, specifically to build a demand for new work. And we also just saw in Bob Harlow's presentation that for PNB, um, their artistic product stayed very much the artistic product, and bringing new audiences was about a, a way of bringing them into what they were already doing, and that product itself had not changed. However, for some organizations, the product does change in some ways to, um, in response to the audience that you're trying to attract. Um, so generally, for anyone on the panel, can you talk a little bit about whether it's new work or how the artistic product itself is changing in response to your audience building efforts? And I think we probably fall closer to the PMB category because one of the things that was significant to us was that while we are adapting the ways that we engage the experience, 
Um, we are really committed to doing work that is both, um, I mean, it runs a gamut. So there are these offerings, and, um, and so ultimately making sure that we are more effective when there's something that is less known to you. Um, otherwise, it was, there's almost a moment, and we sort of realized the moment when the first round of research came in, you sit down with your sales data and you look at all the research, and it would be very easy to respond by almost doing art by numbers, like this is what they want, so let's go do this. Um, we are seeing works that are doing really adaptive work, and that is not our case, so maybe one of the, um, my colleagues here is actually doing that. I was struck by Bob talking about um, not changing the art, the artistic product, because that's it, we're doing the exact opposite. Um, our assumption was, and, and after experimenting with a young professionals group and cheaper tickets, or come and have a have a, a hangout session in a bar after the show with cocktails, we realized that we were attracting. Uh, millennials and younger audiences who were interested in traditional theater and that's great but there seemed to be a threshold and so what the shift that we made is that we said we need to create fundamentally different types of theatrical experiences in order to engage a new and different audience and so we started with Off Center um, experimenting in that space how can we create different types of theatrical experiences what do those look like um, who's interested how do we market them differently. And that has been now a six year journey that we've been on, um, guided by both informal and formal research that we've done to really change our artistic programming in that space. Now, the Denver Center has the luxury of being such a large organization that we can carve out a little bit of space to be doing work like this. And I think that for a smaller organization that has um, you know, a more specific m mission and really targeted programming, it's harder to take a risk like that and, you know, carve out space to do new types of programming. And so I recognize the, the great privilege that we have to be experimenting in that way and trying out new artistic products and to continue and to have the, the um, mandate from the board and the leadership to be experimenting and trying new things. And for a small organization, it's more about, you know, from our signature programs that we have, it's tweaking them a little bit more. It's making more culture relevant to other nationalities as well. So it's not really changing the overall, but just making small changes in what we're doing. Okay, thank you. Um, so Bob also talked about using data and information and not hunches to make your decisions. Um, and to build your strategy. So I wanted to hear a little bit more, either informally or formally, um, how did you learn about your audiences, either your current audience or the new target audience that you wanted to go to? How did you learn about who they are, what their preferences are, um, what their barriers exist for them? Um, was it through market research or through other channels? I'm open for whoever wants to start. Well, um, we do not have the resources to do a large market research, but we rely on survey cards and our communications directly with some of our communities of culture, as well as with our partners. They have the infrastructure to do large um, surveys during our events or programs, so we sit down and come up with uh, some questions uh, in English and Spanish and other languages to understand a better audience who's coming through the door and what they would like to, you know, their experience at, at the program or event that we did and learn from that. And then in our case, um, being associated with this Wallace project, um, there has been quite a bit of research um, and that is a, a huge gift to any organization. In fact, I was in uh, Chicago with the 2,500 organizations about a week ago, I was sitting at a table with an organization of a much larger budget size, and I was making the analogy that perhaps, uh, because this is a rare thing for us, we had dug so deeply into this opportunity, he said, no, it's a rare thing for us too. So I think it is, um, in general, I think it's very hard to find the funds to set aside, regardless of your budget size, there's just more people to feed, there's more mouths to feed, there's more art to buy. So I think that that was interesting. We did a first round of qualitative research, so the focus groups um, sitting behind the glass, I would say my, uh, in, in round one, that, that 
particular experience helped us hear from different parts of our audience, but it also that language helped inform the survey that went out. Uh, a survey followed that and went out into the field. Uh, it stayed in the field or it stayed out until we had 1,500 responses. It gives us a statistically responsible way of saying this, you know, the, these folks think the following. I think, um, and then we've done a second round um, of qualitative, and I just want to compare the first two rounds. The first round, I think we um, absolutely entirely underestimated our audience. I, what I expected to hear and what I heard were very different, very different uh, things. They were much more probing and much more interesting and much kinder to us maybe than I thought that they should have been um, because we had some things really wrong um, in, in basically what we were thinking. Um, we even had marketing materials in front of them and to our best effort, and it was sort of a director's choice kind of thing, they couldn't even read the language we'd written on the page that's like, we thought it was just, you know, lyrical. And they were stumbling all over and we were just sitting back there dying. So it, you, you do have to, to really want to be better. You really have to want to be willing to set this whole thing around the ego aside and thinking about your community and your art form. Just set that all out there. We don't, you know, none of us have it exactly right. When we did the second round um, of going in, and, and each time, as many people as we could put in that booth, if 14 people could be in that booth, we put 14 of us in that booth. If we could fit one more in, we did. Because we needed a wide uh, swath of our organization to hear the information together. The second uh, round of qualitative happened right after we had introduced a prototype. And I'll talk more about that perhaps later, but anyway, I'll just say this much about it at this point. Um, we like left the booth and stopped the prototype. I mean, that's how badly, I mean, we were getting immediate information and that we had really missed some assumptions. So I think the process, I would say whether um, we'll be doing, there's two other projects that we're gonna do uh, within our organization that are not part of the Wallace Project, but we're going to use this whole process. And both of them are starting with the listening tour. And so ultimately, I think the most important thing about research, whether, whether one can afford to have another company come in or whether you're doing the listing yourself. Um, we've just done 16 hours of a listening tour on another topic in our organization. And our assumptions, we wrote our assumptions up, this is what we think the issue is, this is why we think they're not responding to this particular product. We were about 80% wrong. Um, so I just, and it's real, some of the things are very easy to fix. So. Um, uh, if one has an opportunity to have professional research, it is extraordinary. Um, but the tools are there, and actually Bob's book really steps you through the entire process of how to do this. Thank you for that plug. <laughs> so when we started, um, I think this was in 2009, we didn't have a lot of resources um, to support market research, and so we just started doing it on our own very informally and probably not um, very scientifically, but it, we still were able to glean some information from that that would help guide us. So we brought together a bunch of millennials with varying degrees of interest and relation to our organization, and we just had staff members lead them through conversations about what do they come to, what are they interested in, how much do they pay, what do they expect from a night out. Um, the thing that still is seared in my mind from that experience is uh, one of the attendees said theater is a bad brand and um, and that was really difficult to hear because that's our, our line of business um, and our art and we realized that in Off Center we need to sort of brand theater differently and so that really informed some of our early work about the types of experiences we wanted to create and also how we would speak about them to our potential audiences. Um, we also did a lot of informal surveying in the theater where we would literally have a chalkboard in the lobby and when you came in, someone would ask you how you heard about it. Um, and so we were really, you know, collecting data from our audience while they were there. And uh, it was, it was, it was um, human resource intensive, but it cost us nothing and it gained some really significant insight into who was coming and if, if we were gaining traction in that space. Uh, we were then fortunate enough to get accepted into the Wallace program for building audiences for sustainability, and with that, um, as Cookie said, came a tremendous amount of financial resource to support 
doing market research right. And so we learned a ton through that process, both in terms of how to do market research and how to utilize it to inform decision making. Um, so uh, two years ago now almost, we did a round of, of qualitative research with a series of focus groups in Denver, looking at millennials and um, Gen Xers and boomers, traditional and regular theater attendees and people who'd never been before, to try and get inside their head and understand um, what motivates them, what they're interested in, how much they're willing to pay, and also test some of our concepts for a, an offsite immersive theatrical experience. And so that not only guided some really specific specific marketing tactics, but it reinforced some of our assumptions about the type of work and the type of experiences that people would be interested in. Um, we also accompanied that with quantitative research that was again, I think over 1,500 respondents, multiple generations. We were able to break down if they'd been to the Denver Center or not, and uh, got a pretty deep dive a look into a, a, a lot of our potential audiences, but especially millennials. And uh, my colleague Brianna and I presented some of those findings at the Imagine 2020 session in the fall. Um, if you weren't there and are interested in learning more, we're working on compiling some of our key findings from that research uh, into some kind of white paper or infographic that we can share more broadly, and I'm happy to um, informally and once it's ready, formally share that with all of you. But it, it was a really interesting insight into uh, Denver audiences for theater in particular and, and what motivates them, and, and that has continued to underline our work. The third thing that we do now, which has become in a lot of ways the most important, is post-performance surveys. Um, and those are emailed out. We do them for every show at the Denver Center, but for the off-center shows and for a couple of other um, main stage shows that we use as a control, we have a much more detailed survey that Wallace has helped us craft so we can really understand what about the experience and what about the show people responded to. And so that feedback is really um, serving us and informing our work as we move forward. So we're, we've created this sort of constant feedback loop where we make, we put a, a, a new show up and then we can really dissect what people thought about it and what they responded to and use that to inform what we're going to do next. Thank you. Um, when, I, when we were preparing for this panel and we were speaking on the phone, and Marcella, one of the things that you said also is because of the size and resources of your organization, market research for you guys in some ways meant also what's the data that's already publicly available and you talked about um, taking the zip codes of people who are coming to your programs and looking at that against publicly available U.S. Census data to get a sense of who is coming. So I think some common themes that I'm hearing across is data can be expensive or market research can be really expensive. It can also be free, like low cost or no cost. It does take dedication, staff resources, and time. Cookie, thankfully and wonderfully, did a great plug for one of our studies, um, which is available and also on our website, which talks, again, it talks about if you are going to do it on your own, how to do market research on your own. Um, so one, it can be expensive, but low-cost options are available. Two, I'm also hearing not only is the data used upfront in designing your programs, but um, this was a running theme that all three of you had said that you're using data regularly, constantly surveying as a way for constant evaluation um, and constant improvements and having that ongoing feedback loop. Um, and also three, something that was embedded in your comments is that is used across the organization. I like the imagery of pushing and fitting 15 people in a booth, um, but I think also those 15 people were representative of across all the departments in your organization, um, and we, we saw that in the Wallace Excellence Awards as well. Also on the phone, when we were preparing for this panel, each of you talked in some ways about, um, along the way, some of the failures that have happened. Um, and then rebranding, um, instead of calling them failures, calling them experimentation. Um, so I wanted to get a, I mean, on a panel that sounds, you know, it, makes, it seems obvious and it sounds right and it makes sense, but um, of course in reality these things are much harder. So I wanted to ask, how did you encourage that culture of experimentation in your organization, particularly with your staff or your board or wherever those sticking points were? Um, and I think I'll start with, go back in reverse order, start with Cookie and Marcella and Charlie. So, 
how do we build that into our, um, you know, ultimately I think it's at, at one level it starts in the hiring process. So it def definitely over the years when you have a team that comes together, making sure um, these are not always lifetime jobs. You know, sometimes we have a lot of turnover in our organization. So one of the things that happened several years ago was addressing turnover. Um, so that we had a team that stayed cohesively together. Once you have that cohesion, you've got this desire for shared mission. And for us, that is really the driving, the, the driving uh, force of it. Um, I think one of the things that is a moment in time that once it happened, everything changed on the other side of it. And it is this experience around sort of two things, listening and observation. And a number of years ago, and I think it placed us in a, in a good, uh, uh, put us in a good place going into this, but we had decided to think deeply about, uh, we were making a move from, uh, we've been in a uh, sort of one situation, one geographically, one part of our city, and we were moving into the urban core. We were going to be in a much uh, expanded, you know, a 40,000 square foot building in the central business district. So we did a lot of study on this issue of deep observation and listening. And um, when you ask those questions, you don't always get the answers that you think you're going to get. But it is a process, and I think pretty much every one of us, um, we live in a world now where everyone is a critic, everyone has an opinion, and if we're not listening to them, they're just sharing it with someone else. And so ultimately the decision was we'd rather know. We'd rather know on any given day anything that you have to throw at us. Um, and so it doesn't have to be a, a, an angry thing. It can be just keep the information coming. So that was the starting point uh, for us in terms of being able to go into something where you're sitting in a booth and maybe not hearing. It really, really ultimately you are hearing what you want to hear because you're not sitting in the booth, you're not taking this time because you think you have it completely right, because you think you have all the answers. You're taking this time because you want to know more. Uh, you think that your products is, is wonderful. Our organization's been in our city for 60 years. We don't have a declining audience. We, ha we actually have a building audience. Um, we found out from our research that 70% of our audience is under the age of 51. So we have a young audience. Um, and so we're excited about the opportunities, but you can also see how things are shifting very quickly. And so ultimately I think it is, um, for us, I think, across the board. That also means at every level within the organization, uh, someone has to be able to give a, the youngest person in our building has to be able to offer up a criticism that's taken seriously as well. So it's also culturally, I think, within the organization. I don't know that we get it right all the time, but we're focused on it and we're trying. Well, for us, um, failure is an opportunity to grow. Mm -hmm. There you go. <laughs> so we do have the conversations that are honest, uh, not just with the, you know, our partners, but also with the staff, with the board, to say how can we do better next time, or how can where, where did we make the mistake? What did we didn't see? You know. So I think those conversations we and listen, listen to our audience, listen then draw, and um, honesty, being honest, and with everyone around to, to make sure that that doesn't happen again. So at the Denver Center, I have a, a relatively small team of people that are working daily on Off Center. And that group is really bought into this idea about experimentation and testing and learning. And you know, we we celebrated we celebrate failures and we don't call them that, but as being more useful to us than a, a smash hit. Um, and so within a small team, I feel like when you get the right players and everyone's bought into the goals of your project, um, that's relatively easy. This, this challenges that I've had and that we've had is getting the rest of the organization, especially when it's a larger organization, on board with that as well. Um, I think it has to start from the top and the board and the senior leadership needs to be very clear and committed to it. And if they're not, I think it's very difficult to succeed. Even then, I've, I've, I think it's easy to talk the talk and it's much more difficult to walk the walk. In fact, I got a call from a board member uh, yesterday expressing some concerns about the quality of our most recent production. Um, 
and had to explain that this was an experiment. We were very deliberate in crafting it this way so that we could test a very different end of the immersive or experiential spectrum. Um, and that, you know, a lot of people respond to it, some people didn't, and that's the point. Um, and so even though this board member has been very vocally supportive of this experimentation, when it comes down to it and, and they didn't like the show, <laughs> then it's like, well, this is what we committed to and this is what we signed up for. Um, and it does take time. I think it takes successes that you can um, hold up as this is the result of this process. Um, and it takes time to communicate and to get people on board. Uh, we had a consultant once who specialized in organizational change talk about run with the horses that want to run with you. And I think as you're getting this started, you need to focus on the people who are passionate about it and committed to it and let those who uh, are maybe more in the over my dead body category uh, <laughs> come along in their own time. So it is time, it takes time. Uh, the leadership needs to be really genuinely committed to it. Um, and then I think the last piece that, it, that connected to this conversation I had with the board member is it, you sometimes challenge your own institutional definitions of quality, and that's a really scary place to be. Um, we like to produce work at a very high level, and there are real expectations internally and externally, and when you start doing these faster prototypes or experiments um, that are gonna look and feel different, that can create a lot of um, anxiety for people and I think tension internally, and so you just have to be prepared to have those difficult conversations and uh, open yourself up to see what's going to happen. Great, thank you. Um, so Marcella, even with partnerships, um, I was really struck by the impact that your organization has and then even more to find out that your organization is two and a half staff members. Um, so even with partnerships, um, you still have a lot of demands on your staff and your time. Um, so how do you prioritize audience building? How does this fall in relation to all the other efforts that you have going on at the at MCC? And how do you sustain this as a priority? Well, we are committed to raising, um, in elevating the Mexican culture in, in Colorado. And we are committed to communities of color. So that's, we have a personal commitment in, with the board and with the staff. Um, it is and always will be a challenge. Um, I don't think there's a um, black and white, it's black and white, I think it's the multicultural, I think that multicultural colors, sorry. So you just have to be um, understanding that's part of who we are, you know. Building audiences, it's not one thing that you put us, okay, this is one thing that we have to do. It's an integral part, you know, it's creating better programs, it's creating um, better, you know, better partners, even though our partners are amazing. We just have to be thoughtful that the audience is the most important, in the, the most important thing that we have to do. Without our audience, without the diverse audience, we will not exist. We have to make sure that um, with the, you know, as well as with the commitment of our partners to really have those honest conversations. How can we work together? How can, when we go and create a partnership or we do something at other institutions, it's not just about us going there and doing the work or working with institutions and bringing diversity through their doors. When we leave, when that event or that program is done, what are we leaving behind? Is the institution where we were, are they, is that just check the list, is that relevant? Or are they really going to look at the organization saying, you know, this is important for our community, this is important by hiring diverse um, staff members to make sure that if they, when they do another cultural relevant um, event or program or exhibit, they have the staff that understands. So it's not only about us going in and working with them, it's what uh, the Mexican Cultural Center wants to do is leave a mark behind. 
we want to make sure that the partnership is not just you walk into the door and leave and there's nothing left behind. It's, you know, we want to create a culture that it becomes relevant for everyone. Um, when we spoke on the phone, I was struck that um, you always came back to your mission, which is related to education around Mexican culture, and recognizing that your audience, you did great with the Mexican American population, um, but if your mission is really about education, you really needed to bring all kinds of people in. So I like that you kept that ongoing focus and dedication in everything that you did. Um, so when I brushed through saying that the bios were um, were in your packets, I also, um, you've probably seen by now, both Charlie and Cookie Austin, uh, Cookie at Valley Austin are with Wallace in our current initiative. We were just in Chicago about a week ago um, with all the 25 organizations coming together to talk about what we were learning so far, what we still wanted to learn, and for the organizations to hear from each other. Um, one of the themes in that convening was a tension between trying to be a data-driven organization and a tension with the artistic side of the organization. Um, I forgot what they call it, being an emotional-driven organization. Um, and with a lot of emphasis in this panel and in the talks of also about using data, whether it comes from market research or from experience and whatever form data is. Um, I wanted to dive into this a little bit more. So for Charlie, as artistic producer, how do you use data in whatever form it comes in? Um, and how do you, um, what value does that data hold for you? And do you experience that tension? Uh, yes, I experience that tension. <laughs> uh, I think it, We also like open-ended questions, yeah. and I failed to ask an open-ended no, no, question. No, <laughs> um, no, I, I think this is something that ever since that convening has been really buzzing in my mind, and I. I don't know if I have a totally cohesive answer, so I'll, I'll just share some of what's uh, going through my mind on the topic. Um, I think there is a tension between using between data and artistic decision making. Um, there is a special sauce, as I like to call it, or a little bit of magic, or subjectivity, um, and personal preference that goes into choosing an artistic season, and that's what it's about. Um, and. If you, and my favorite Henry Ford quote is, if I asked the people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Uh, and I think that sums it up, that it takes a leap of imagination to figure out what people don't even know that they want. And so, and that's what is so exciting about artistic practice and, and, um, and our, all of our art forms. And yet, there's a lot to be gleaned from what people are interested in that can shape that. And so I think that these things need to exist in a healthy tension. You can't ignore the data, and you also can't totally rely on it to make your artistic decisions. Um, likewise, I think we've seen, uh, uh, historically, there's been some pretty um, significant silos between the artistic department and the marketing department. Um, and I imagine in some of your worlds, you've experienced similar tensions. Uh, and I think that this work has brought us much closer together, collaborating in different ways around shared goals and kind of blurring the lines in terms of what's appropriate um, or expected for each person given their role to contribute to the other. And so, um, again, I don't think it's a formula, but I think it's really important to hold both together and to use what you can from the data to inform your decision making but also not lose that element of magic that makes, um, makes theater and all of our art forms so exciting. And for Cookie, when we were talking on the phone a little bit about some of the information and market research that your organization received, a couple times you called some of the insights the blinding flash of the obvious. Um, so I thought, for the people in this room, could you describe maybe one or two examples of that blinding flash of the obvious and how you took that information to make some changes or adjustments at Valley Austin. Sure. Um, so um, at the very beginning of our process, we, we went out, we did the research, we did the data, we came back. And I, I mean, I guess at every level we know um, that the audience is not a, a monolithic being, that the audience is not homogeneous. But again, for the last 20 years, I've gone to conferences where we've talked about audience engagement and it, as if we do all these things and there's a, a lect demo, certain period of out, there's a 
perhaps a, a, a lecture before, there's a, perhaps a talk back afterwards, sort of monolithically do these things and that's audience engagement. So one of the things we had to accept that is just you know, a blinding flash of the obvious, we do Myers-Briggs for everybody that walks in our, you know, our dancers do myers but We understand and we think about personalities of the board, how we relate to each other, and how it like, never dawned on us that the audience is just as diverse and interesting as the people that are close in our lives. So that was one of those things where you just sort of went, what? Um, and I think um, we also, we, we felt very much along the way that we were dealing with, um, this is the, the lack of, uh, of uh, we have a lack of familiarity. So when you have a lack of familiarity, it seems as if, if I give you more information, then this will now be familiar. And so it just seemed like, well, this is, we got this done. All we have to do is give you more information and, and we're good to go. And ultimately, we found out from the research that our audience was very specific about two really profound connections to us. One is social and one is emotional. And um, they had a very strong preference for social, this is social connection and emotional connection. Again, one like uh, extrovert and introvert. So um, if you want a social connection with us, you may not want an emotional connection at all. You may want to go curb to curb from your curb back to your curb. And the entire time, our goal is to really be your partner in sending you like little short clips and things that help you go out and get other people to come with you. So we found this was a, a vast interest, and we were underperforming in that area by about 35%. The same thing on the emotional connection, the people that wanted more of a more emotional and intellectual connection, and one might overlay uh, almost the difference between an extrovert and an introvert, if you wanted to, to make that sort of an assumption, although these were not mutually exclusive. We had to go back and think about our audience engagement activities and see did we have them divided that way? Was everything so social that there was less emotional and, and intellectual or the other way around? Well, we, we ended up putting sort of a two by two logic model together and ultimately, uh, once you buy the ticket, we practically drive you to, come to your house and drive you to the performance. I mean, once you buy the ticket, we are sending you stuff nonstop. Um, but it looked like we were missing some things up front. Um, and I think um, the other sort of blinding flash of the obvious that was shocking to us uh, was finding out we thought we were going to go, be, we, you know, we, we were very interested in unleashing the voice of the artist, whatever that might be. And in our world, this, this project is done with artistic and administrative together, so we're co-leading this project, the associate artistic director and myself. And so the work is quite diverse. We might, we might have three rock bands on stage, we might have a chamber uh, group on stage, we might have uh, the Symphony in the Pit or musicians on stage. So it's, it works quite diverse. So we said, well, in order to get you to feel more comfortable uh, with this new work, we just need to make everyone more curious. We just need to develop trust, and we need to really think about encouraging people to be more curious. Well, the blinding flash of the obvious from our research was that curiosity is about as hardwired as being an extrovert or an introvert. If you're not curious, chances are I'm not going to be the one to make you curious. And so ultimately, we had to recognize that there is a presence of this thing called the uncertainty gap. And that, once that was identified through our research, that is palpable. We can feel it. So you're coming along, there's interest, and there's interest, and then it's just all of a sudden, that potential buyer just stops. And so what happens next is there is this space that we refer to as the uncertainty gap. We don't know whether your uncertainty gap is an inch wide or as wide as the Grand Canyon. So ultimately what we're trying to figure out by recognizing, lightning flash of the obvious, that everyone in this room is not the same, how you will relate to the experience of coming and being with us is not going to be the same. Uh, we realized if you're, um, if you're wanting a social experience, we have a rather awkward building in terms of the way the building is structured. We've been trying to bring the people to the party. We realized we've got to bring the, the party to you. Wherever you are in our space, we've got to wrap you in a level of energy and music and opportunities for you to do things wherever you are. So it's causing us to rethink a lot of things, but um, yeah, a few of those you feel like, wow, how did we not know that? I guess the last um, piece that happened directly out of that second round of research 
is we had spent a lot of um, time and energy bringing people into the studio. And we thought, well, we, we will, um, our building is now, it's downtown where there's construction all around us. So we said, well, we live in a city that's based on technology. More technology must be a great idea. So if you can have a Lect demo in your studio, we'll just live stream it. So we did this actually really very effectively. We got really good at this. Um, and ultimately, our artistic director was with the dancers. We were taken inside of the theater. It was about a 30 minute show. We had a production team, three cameras, a boom. Uh, our marketing director, is, um, her background's in television, so we had people that were mic'd that were giving color commentary, and, and you know, we throw it to you, Stephen, and Stephen's with the dancers. So we brought everyone into a behind the scenes experience. Well, guess what? Unless you are someone who is already purchasing that product, we forgot that we need to talk we need to talk and think and communicate with you where you are, not where we want you to be. Ugh, the blinding flash of the obvious. So it was not only, well, we showed them, if they had not seen the live stream, we actually showed them, we had the researcher that, that was uh, doing the interview, show them the video. Their response was so fast and so visceral and so negative, it was just <laughs> stunning to us. Um, they hated it. They absolutely hated it. And it was, um, in a way, going back to what Bob was saying today, there was no context for it. We had assumed that they understood that for a work to get on stage, it's hours and hours and hours in the studio. They didn't have any context for the studio. And so the idea that everybody wants to be behind the scenes, they said things like, why aren't they in their costumes? And then they said, couldn't Bally Austin afford to do this at the theater? Um, why, are there, why, why are they in those clothing? Why, why don't the dancers have their hair fixed? It was amazing to us that this group of people wanted to see it exactly like it was going to be. So that, again, um, we've spent years thinking everybody wants to be behind the scenes. Everyone does not want to be behind the scenes. We've heard from them <laughs> loud and clear. So we walked out of that booth. We went to work the next day, and we stopped doing that live stream. Now, we had people from 12 countries dialing in, but they couldn't buy a ticket. So ultimately, the blinding flashes of the obvious remind us, why, why do we have that strategy? What is its goal? And if it's not reaching that goal, stop doing it, no matter how good we thought we were at it. So. Thank you. One of the things that we're learning so far in the experience of the 25 organizations is they might have a pre- or post-performance activity. It looks like a great success. Um, the quality is great, the headcount is there, it's a sold out space or near capacity space. But then if you look a level deeper into the data, you're actually getting your most, or at least for the 25 organizations, they were getting their most loyal people who loved what they do and couldn't get enough of what they do and they were not getting the new audience. So again, going back to being very mindful of what is your goal for that program. And if it is to deepen the experience of your current audience, great. But if it's to bring in a new, you are not achieving that goal with your, uh, the, with the way those engagement events were designed. So I want to welcome Bob Harlow back to the area, um, and we'll get ready for Q and A. And while he's making his way up here.